All right, everybody, let's dive into this legal analysis of the case that happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota. All right, this video is designed for anyone, whether you went to law school or not, whether you are a licensed attorney or not, to watch this video and to understand what could happen to the defendant, the police officer, who caused the death of Mr. Floyd. So I want to say one more thing before we dive into the charges is that I'm going to say S versus D. S stands for the state of Minnesota, S versus D, the defendant, which would be the police officer. Because more than likely the DA of Hennepin County will be the one who will deal with this case in order to charge the defendant. So now we have that established, let's dive into the possible charges. All right, so we have murder. And I repeat, do not, do not believe anyone online in terms of what their definition of murder is unless they went to law school or they are a licensed attorney. Do not go on Google because they are all wrong. And the law can easily be misinterpreted if you have not studied it. Okay. All right. So murder. Murder means the unlawful killing of another, which means that the killing was unlawful, with malice of forethought. So malice of forethought is needed in order for the defendant to be liable for murder. Malice of forethought has these four important things. Okay, the defendant only needs one of the four. D only needs one of the four to be liable for murder. And if we have more than one, that only makes the prosecution's argument stronger and better in order to prosecute D to be liable for murder. I easily crossed off felony murder rule because D was in the course and scope of his employment as a police officer. He was not committing a felony, right? Therefore, I can easily cross out the felony murder rule. I don't want to get into that at all. It's a big waste of time. However, express malice is important here. Express malice means the intent to kill. Implied malice means the intent to cause serious bodily harm. One, reckless conduct means that the defendant was acting very recklessly. Example of this is that the defendant was misusing a deadly weapon, which caused the death of another person. Okay, so it's easy to put a small check mark there. So express malice, again, means the intent to kill. That D had the intent to kill the victim, right? So in this case, it's going to be hard to prove express malice. However, it's possible because D was using his knee as a means in order to prevent Mr. Floyd from breathing. That is what S will argue in this case. That S will say that D clearly had the intent to kill Mr. Floyd because D used his knee as a means in order to cause Mr. Floyd serious bodily harm. And he had the intent to use his knee in order to prevent him from breathing. And any reasonable person will know that anyone needs oxygen in order to function in order to in order to survive right the brain needs oxygen in order to function the body right in order for the body to function properly excuse me right so therefore s will argue that d may have had expressed malice the intent to kill mr floyd because he used his knee in a really hard way on uh the victim's neck in order to prevent him from breathing for a long period of time, right? The whole video is about 10 minutes long and eight to nine out of the 10 minutes, D used his knee as a means to prevent Mr. Floyd from breathing, okay? However, express miles is still hard to prove, but it's possible, okay? So that's why I put a check mark there because it's possible. Implied miles is more of a reality here. Okay, 
that the defendant had the intent. D had the intent to cause Mr. Floyd serious bodily harm because he knew that Mr. Floyd could not breathe. He informed, Mr. Floyd informed D that he could not breathe by D using his knee in order to cause him harm. Okay? Mr. Floyd was already detained. He was on the ground and he was already complying with what was happening. Therefore, he posed no threat to the police officer. He posed no threat to D. Therefore, he could not be a threat to D. And also, D clearly had the intent to cause him serious bodily injury. I'm going to put SBI here. Serious bodily injury because he used his knee in order to block him from breathing. Okay? For 8 to 10 minutes. Not a minute, but 8 to 10 minutes. With the knowledge that he could not breathe throughout the whole video. Moreover, we can state that this is wanton and reckless conduct because it is wanton and reckless conduct for D to press on the victim's neck for that amount of time with the knowledge that Mr. Floyd could not breathe because of the pressure that was placed on his windpipe. Therefore, wanton and reckless conduct is satisfied and the defendant could be liable for murder. As I said before, expressed malice can be hairy. Very, very hairy. Okay? It might be hard to prove this. The prosecution may not be able to prove this. However, we definitely have implied malice here. And we definitely have wanton and reckless conduct here. Because of the act that D made by placing his knee in a very hard way on the victim's neck from preventing him from breathing right not just hurting that area of his body but preventing him from breathing which can cause anyone serious bodily injury right sbi serious bodily injury and this act of causing mr floyd's serious bodily injury led to his death Therefore, murder is clearly satisfied here. Okay? And I see some arguments, and this is a very poor argument, that he may have had, Mr. Floyd, may have had some type of medical condition. Under the law, it does not really matter what type of condition the victim had. You take your victim as you have him. Basically, in law school, we call it a thin skull plaintiff, right? It doesn't matter whether A would have survived the force that D placed on Mr. Floyd's neck, right? This is long as Mr. Floyd himself died by that pressure. The defendant, the police officer, has to take the victim as he has him, right? So it doesn't really matter whether I would survive that amount of pressure on my neck or you would survive that amount of pressure on your neck. It does not matter. You take your victim as you have them. Okay? That is especially true under injury law. However, I want to stay focused on criminal law here because we are talking about a criminal case. And it still holds true in criminal law. That you take your plaintiff as you have them. Okay? One last thing I want to talk about here is first degree murder. Okay? And I really emphasize that I want you all to ignore anyone who did not go to law school, to ignore anyone who did not, who is not currently practicing as an attorney. Don't don't believe what they're saying because a lot of them don't know the law. They are complete BS. And don't look it up on Google because that's not true either. Okay? Because anyone can read the law and misinterpret it very easily. Okay? I just wanted to emphasize that again. So first degree murder means the specific intent to kill which means that D had the intent to kill the victim before it happened, plus premeditation and deliberation. Premeditation means that the defendant had the thought process of wanting to kill the victim before it happened. He thought about it, he or she thought about it, and deliberated by acting in cold blood, by ending the person's life. And to be more precise here, deliberation means that D acted 
in cold blood, a cold blooded act and not an impulsive act. Okay, an example of a cold blooded act is A shooting B in the back of the head, A stabbing B 10 times in the chest. That is a cold blooded act. In this case, the intent here, right? Remember the first piece, the first element of first degree murder is the specific intent to kill. Okay, the intent element is already satisfied down here in murder because we have implied malice, one or reckless conduct, and maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe expressed malice. But we for sure have implied malice and wanton and reckless conduct. Therefore, the specific intent to kill is already satisfied. We have premeditation, okay? Which means that D thought about killing the defendant before the killing actually happened, right? Before the victim actually died. And again, that's already satisfied under murder because we knew that Mr. Floyd informed D that he could not breathe. And we all reasonably know that if we do something that prevents someone from, from breathing, that person can either experience SBI, serious bodily injury, or death. In this serious bodily injury, right, that was caused by D's extensive, excessive force on Mr. Floyd's neck led to his death. Therefore, premeditation is already satisfied. Or it could be. Again, in law, everything is great. We'll have to see. Lastly, we have deliberation. A cold-blooded act. D clearly made, <clears throat> committed a cold-blooded act because he placed his knee on the victim's neck for a long period of time in order to cause him injury knowing that the victim could not breathe. Therefore, S will argue that that was him acting in deliberation. I think murder is more the reality in this case. I think that the defendant, the police officer, D, had implied malice, the intent to cause serious bodily injury, and acted wanton reckless conduct by placing his knee on the victim's neck for eight to 10 minutes, knowing throughout that time period that he could not breathe. And moreover, <clears throat> the, def the defense might argue self-defense. Self-defense means that the defendant had the reasonable belief that he was under serious bodily harm or death. Okay, as we know from the facts of the story, not only the video, but also the facts of the story. Okay, Mr. Floyd was about to be liable. At least he suspected he's going to be liable for forgery. Okay, and they placed him in cuffs and detained him on the ground. As you can see, he was lying on the ground and he was no threat. He was no longer a threat to D, the police officer. So therefore, how, how can someone in cuffs who's already detained on the ground, face down on the ground, by the way, already in pain, as you can see in his face, he's already in pain, he's detained, he's no longer a threat, and D already had three of his buddies with him as backup. Therefore, self-defense is a very poor defense because he did not have the reasonable belief that Mr. Floyd was going to cause him serious bodily harm or death because he was already in cuffs, face down on the ground, with backup, and also, he was an unarmed victim. Therefore, self-defense is a very poor defense. So I hope this helped anyone who watches this video in order to comprehend what may happen to the police officer, assuming that DA in Hennepin County places the charges on D. Thank you.